Today, we're going to be talking about chapter 11, comparing models with resampling. And so chapter 10 is, is a buildup of the last previous chapter that talked about resampling and, you know, getting metrics and evaluating the performance of the model. And so this chapter kind of adds on to it by saying, you know, let's use a workflow, workflow sets and workflow map to kind of take it from doing one model metric at a time and, you know, incrementally doing it once at a time, doing it over and over and then joining them all together to get, you know, metrics for different models. And so instead of doing that um, in that rep, rep, instead of repeating it, you can, you know, use the work set and do it in a much faster way so that you can see multiple models, whether it be one or five or however, however many you want. And that way you can have a better idea of, you know, this model is better than that model. I'll, I'll go with that one. And so the learning objectives is to calculate performance statistics with multiple models, recognize that within resample correlation can impact model comparison and how to deal with that, uh, define practical effect size, compare models using differences in uh, matrices, and then using the title tidy posterior to compare models using uh, Bayesian methods. So last chapter is probably going to look very similar, familiar, but to calculate performance metrics, you have this model that you've built using, you know, your workflow, and then you collect your metrics and you summarize them, and then you choose what specific metric you want to look at. And so in this example, we're looking at R squared, and then you select your, your ID, which is the R squared, and then your model, and then look at the estimate, and that can get you your R squared for one specific model. And in order to do that for different models, you, you, you'll do it over and over again. And so that can get repetitive. It can make your codec longer than it needs to be. And so what they do is they introduce these workflow sets. And so these workflow sets, they take multiple parameters. And so the first parameter is you got to define in a list your pre-processing. And so these will be your recipes that we've created before. And so you might have, well, I want to work on a linear model, but I'm not sure which specific recipe I want to do. So do I want to just do a basic one? Do you have a basic recipe? Do I want to include an interaction term? Um, and then your splines. And so instead of, you know, oh, let me take out the interaction term and run it again. And then, you know, trying to save that on, trying to figure out, you know, which one is the right one. And instead of, you know, trying to do that, you can just pre-process them and then you define your model in a list. And here you can hear that linear model refers to your recipe, your, your not the recipe, but the model that you specified earlier. So you would have specified that before. And so here you can, in this model, you can specify a linear model, a GLM model, a for, random forest model, or however models you want, but you also you got to recognize that some of these pre-processing might not fit into these models here. And then the cross is, is asking you, do you want to do a combination? So it's going to go linear model with basic recipe, linear model with interaction term, a linear model with splines. And so after you do that, you know, you use the workflow map function, which is similar. They described it as similar to the per. It's like a per-like function, but instead of doing it on lists, you're doing it on this workflow. It's more geared toward tidy, tidy models but the same the approach and the mentality of it is pretty much the same. And so here you specify your function. And I think when I looked at the documentation, there are specific, there's a limited amount of functions that you can use. There's like fits resample, then there's tune grid and a, and a couple other tune variation ones, but there is a specified amount, a specified list of functions that the argument can take. And then finally, you feed your resamples, which you would define using your, your, your folds. And so after doing all that, you're not really doing anything in the, in the sense that uh, then after you, you know, define your linear model, then you collect the metrics from, from each of these models here. So it, what it's going to do, it's going to fit the model and then iterate through each of these recipes. So it's doing an iteration and it's mapping over the work flow set that you created before. So you don't have, again, so this avoids, you know, let me do basic recipe one, save that. Let me do uh, my linear model interaction term. Let me do my linear model splines individually and then do the join. So it's 
it's avoiding this here. It's avoiding doing that individually. And so then at the end, you can collect your metrics and then you filter on whatever metric you want. And then you can look at each of these comparatively instead of doing it over. So with the workflow map, you can, you can use functions that you would use on a single single model or a single workflow and iterate over. Yeah. So yeah, so yeah, so I think the workflow, so as long as you define the recipe in your linear models here, I think, I'm not sure how it would work if you give it a recipe that's not conducive to that model specifically. I think you do talk about that later on, but this cross here will, might cause some problems, but yeah, it just, it's going to go over, it's going to iterate over every single, it's just like a workflow set that you, you you normally do on one, but you're doing it on a multiple different, you're doing it you know, multiple times on different recipes. If that, does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, actually, so what's a bit strange to me is that why do you have to define the function as a, as a string? So with per, you normally, yeah, that's in a list and the function as, as a function object and here. Um, but maybe because probably. they only allow a few, a few specific functions and not, not any function. It probably does the evaluation of the expression in the function. Uh, I think the meta programming uh, chapter covers in, this in advanced. I think I think I have it. Let's see. Is this the right one? Workflow sets. I think I was looking at this earlier. Where is it? Yeah, I don't. On the help page, it says just the function to run. So it might be able to give a function or a string. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that is, I don't know. I think the only way is to try, I guess. If, yeah. you, if you fit it the fit models in a string and outside of a function to see if there would be a difference if it would return an error. But that's, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a one way to test it out. So I think after you do that, and I think after you calculate your performance statistics, then you, you know you could do that multiple times on different models, and um, and then from so then they go into the within sample correlation. So when I think they describe it as different folds are going to perform better than others, just because of the way I don't know why, but I think it's just the way the resampling works. Some it's just going to end up that some folds are just better than the others, and so I think. Some big takeaway that I got from the chapter is I think you they want to emphasize that we're comparing the model. We want to avoid as we don't want to end up by, you know, by default or by accident comparing, talking about how we're comparing the folds when in reality we want to compare the, mold, the, the models. And so I think they want to really emphasize that when you compare, you should be comparing the models. And so you do have to take into account that, you know, the correlation or the differences in, in folds and how that can impact the performance of the model. And so I think having these, these visualizations and these kind of like diagnostic tests, you can really see, oh, is it really, am I really capturing what model's better or am I capturing the difference in folds within the models? And so I think having this visualization here, to me, I think the visualization helped a little. I think it's each of these lines here is a different fold. And so you have, you know, one, fold one through N. And I think, I don't know if it's safe to assume that just by looking at this, you can say, oh, the random forest just does better. I think the random forest does better within when it comes to looking at these individually. In fold one, yeah, random forest does better, but 
if you look at them individually, it still doesn't capture the, well, won't we want to look at the entire model? So that means we have to look at all the, the folds together. And so I think that's what they're trying to emphasize here is, is yes, the, the fold, you can see that the folds, some folds do better than others, but you have to take in a more holistic approach and look at what are all the folds within random forest, all the folds within with splines and then all the um, folds within no splines to really get a better idea of um, which models are best. And I think they talk about then, okay, how do we, how do we account for those differences in, in folds? And they go into that. But this, did this visualization make sense to y'all? Yeah, so they, they were talking about when you see these parallel lines, then that means there's some part of the performance metric that is explainable by what fold you are testing on. So like this green one is always the worst. Yeah. So part of the variation in the performance is due to just the fold itself. Yeah, and I think that's what they're trying to, you know, account for and want us to understand. So they, they talk briefly about practical, practical effect size and how I think when it comes to building models, you also have to ask yourself, if I'm gonna, you know, I have my model in production and I wanna create a new one, is it really worth my time to say, you know, this model does 0.5% better or 1% better? Is it worth your time to really create the new model and then put it into production and do it all over again? I think they were trying to say, you know, it is subjective of what a difference means or, what statistically significant means. And I think keeping that in, in mind when working with uh, resampling and comparing models is it at the end of the day, is it worth your time to really re-implement it or change it all up just for a small performance? And it might be that 1% is much better, it is better, but, or you might say I need 5% or so. And so I think keeping that in mind, and I, I did enjoy that the, you know, put that small note in there to say, um, it might make a difference or what is what difference matters to you. Okay, so then when talking, so then to account for difference in the resampling, they, they, they take an approach of when you do an ANOVA test, you, you, it's a difference between the groups to see is there you know, a statistically significant difference between the groups themselves. And so they say, well, uh, let's take that similar approach, but let's use models instead of groups. And, you know, a, a, a model can be a group. But so the simple way we just to, to take your estimates and find the difference between, you know, find the difference between with splines and no splines, and then create a model, tidy that, model and then select your estimate, your p-value, and then your confidence intervals. And then that allows you to see the difference between, it removes the noise, removes or cancel out, cancels out the difference that might stem from the resampling and only focuses on the model itself and saying, you know, is this model better, is model A better than model B solely on the premise of the model itself and not on anything else that might be impacting it. This, this section, I think this section did include a lot of the theory that I wasn't, that was kind of, kind of got some of it, but I think the premise is there are multiple ways and I think you can do the subtraction or they talk about you can do that simple subtraction way, or you can there's you can take the Bayesian approach. And so the Bayesian approach introduces the the tidy posterior package, which helps you. Let me see what. 
So it's, it compares resampling method. This is the objective of tidy posterior. So you can do it with subtraction or you can use the tidy posterior package. And so in the package, you take your folds, you bind them with your estimates, selecting the ID that you want. And then this performance modification here, I think I found a little confusing, but I think I'll come back. Yeah, those are all settings for a Bayesian model. They don't really have anything to do with the prior workflow set. Okay, yeah, so then I guess if you know exactly what much about the Bayesian models and you'll you'll understand what, what all those arguments are then. So then here at the bottom, I, then this is where you're comparing your models. Again, I don't know why they're called as a character versus a string. Um, and so then so you, you run your summary and then you give it your practical size that you want to observe. And I think, so then you have your, your practical equivalent here that shows the difference in with your splines and no splines. So do you know what, so what are we iterating over? So, so we have the same like 10 folds mm -hmm. or we repeat the resampling process as well. But we have the same 10 folds and the performance metrics and based on that 10 pairs of performance metrics, we try to estimate whether it's better or not. You mean that iter argument? Yes. That's for sampling from the posterior distribution. That's okay. basically how many samples do you want from the posterior to give you a distribution of your parameter estimate? It's for Bayesian because, um, yeah, this is a Bayesian model and to get your parameter estimates, you have to um, estimate the posterior, but usually you have to kind of sample values um, in an iterative fashion to then build that posterior. So you get like 5,000 samples and then you can estimate the density basically. So it'd be like, if you knew the posterior was normal, mean five, standard deviation 10, you took 5,000 random samples from that, you could then rebuild that density curve. Does that kind of make sense? But we don't actually know the posterior in closed form. Well, we might for this is a very basic example, but anyway, it's, it's not about the, previous resampling and the folds and the workflow, it's all separate. Okay, thanks. And I think I, when I was reading this, I went to the actual documentation of post, the posterior and I found it here. I found the, the documentation a little bit simpler or I found it more understanding. And so you're building your, so like, I think they take, well, let's look at a list logistic regression GLM and then a classification model. And then you're going through your workflow here and you're resampling your logistic, your other font, your classification model. And then you're collecting your metrics like you would, and then you full join them and so here you have your folds, your, your metrics for each of these folds, for each fold. And then from that, then you come to the, your performance. And then I think, I think this is what you're talking about, the iterations here. Yeah. Um, so it's just fitting that, I think they have it in the book. Yeah, this linear model 
and the data is the performance and then the model uh, indicator, like which model is it from and the fold indicator. Those are like your covariates kind of. And then to estimate the betas, which would be that difference, right? Like the size of the difference. You have to sample from the posterior distribution of that parameter. I don't know. It's kind of a little abstract how I'm just saying things I know, but I think. Yeah, so this is A AUC. AUC. Um, you can build a posterior for any quantity that you can calculate from your parameters. So maybe on each iteration, they're calculating what's the AUC given that difference. Or I guess this wouldn't be a difference. This would be just a logistic regression. I don't know. I actually don't know what this is. Yeah, I think for me that that Bayesian approach was a little kind of went over my head. I think maybe doing this this more of the simple comparison might be a way to start off with. And then from that going in, I think once you understand this kind of this difference, then you can move into more of the Bayesian in the posterior model. Cause I think some of those arguments. I don't know if the, the arguments are, I don't know if like this iteration here is, is it, if there's a default or like these chains have a default, I assume they have a default. And yeah, you can there are the like defaults, yeah. Okay, so I think I, that, go ahead. I think they bring it up because they talk about random effects and some, I mean, myself included, I think it's way easier to have random effects in Bayesian models than in infrequentist models. Because <laughs> um, in, in a frequentist model, you'd, you have to do like restricted maximum likelihood to estimate random effect. I mean, R will do it for you, but as a model builder, I think random effects are easier in Bayesian, but I don't know. Maybe Daniel has some more opinions. <laughs> I've only taken like one Bayesian class. <laughs> like, so I think it's easier to put in a random effect because it's literally like add in like random distribution. I think that's, I want to say that's why it's easier, but. Um, but yeah, I, I'm still like trying to figure out what this code is actually doing. Cause like, I understand how to do Bayesian models like totally separate from like this whole framework. Yeah. I just, I think that one of the best way, I guess I haven't done it, but I think what I would do now is actually run it and see, I think, just reading through the book was helped. I think the first half when it talked about how to build metrics or how to build metrics and build all the models together and use the workflow sets, I think that was really helpful. But when it comes to like these Bayesian methods and and this differences, I think working with the actual code in R might be more helpful. And I think going forward, I think that's what I would do is to actually- yeah. I would say you could, they didn't actually talk, do the code, but the reason to do the differencing is that they mentioned um, your error estimation will be inflated when you don't account for the correlation within the folds. So if you wanna see that, you can just fit like a model on not the differences, just like a, um, what was it? 
this is linear regression on the metric with an indicator whether it was from model one or two and you can look at the standard error of that difference and it should be a lot bigger than when you do the actual differences that makes sense <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, well, for me personally, I think I should read about Bayesian methods regardless of this tidy models framework first. And when I have a solid understanding, then come back because it, it, it was too much for me, to be honest. So, but it's, it's, it's not re related to, to tidy models, really. Yeah, no, it's not. It's just like an estimation technique, I guess, framework. Okay, I think that's pretty much what the, the chapter covered. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. It was kind of a, I think the first half was kind of, straightforward. I think that made more sense for me. I think making sure that you account for the differences of folds when creating your models because of the impacts they can have. And then, you know, they provide, you can use a Bayesian approach or you can use this other approach where it's a difference in models. But are there any like, questions or comments? Um, yeah, I have a question actually. Um, in that first workflow set, there was a uh, cross equals false. Why yeah. is that? I think it, it defaults to cross equals false. Uh, let's, and I think what it, the crossing is doing, it is going saying, you know, linear model, basic linear model interact and linear model splines. So I think when you have more than one, you may not want to do that because I think it, it accounts for what if you have like a random forest and you're trying to use a basic recipe on it that necessarily wouldn't work. And so by saying cross is false, I think it just takes, it applies the basic model to the linear model. Isn't that what cross is anyway? Say that again? Isn't that what cross does anyway? It applies your models and uh, recipes together? Yeah. Like, I think, so I think in, in, in this case, it, it doesn't matter, but, as, but it, it would matter if you had multiple recipes and multiple models. Then with cross, let's say, uh, so if, if you have two models and three recipes, it makes sense to combine, combine with in, in any combination. And that would be cross equal true. Or you can say that with this model, I want to do. So, so, it, it, so I think if you have cross equals false, then you have to provide the same number of pre-processing and the same number of models and it will like combine this one by one. Okay. So is there like an extra argument that we provide to uh, specify what recipes go with what models? Like I'm just reading Daniel's uh, chat here. I think um, it will use, no, I think it will like the first pre-processing with the first model, the second pre-processing with the second model okay. and so on. Like, okay. I think in, in this case, it's like there's also recycling. So there's a free, free long list of pre-processing, but only a one, one element list. So there's, there's also a recycling, which makes it more complicated. Okay. Do you know if it'll throw an error if there was two models, let's say, in this example? I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. 
according to the to Daniel's documentation. Yeah. I guess it's kind of weird that it's like in the documentation, it's like if false, the length should be full, but in this example, it's not. <laughs> Yeah, so I just want to know if it'll recycle if there's two models. So what the, I don't know, I guess I'll figure out. So I guess the, if you really want to check if it recycles, um, because like in regular R, it only recycles if one is a multiple of the other. So like if there were two models here, it would definitely not work. But if there were four pre-processing, I don't know if that will work, if that makes sense. Okay. Because yeah, right I'm now thinking. one is gonna one is always a multiple of like any number, so it it'll recycle that one model across those three pre-processing steps. Um, but I, but two is not a multiple of three, but two is a multiple of four. So if you have a fourth preprocessor and a second model, I don't know if that will automatically recycle. Part of me will say like, I hope that throws an error because that's really scary. And I and I don't like the fact that R does <laughs> recycling like that. Um, but, but yeah, I guess that's something we would have to try out. Okay. Does it? I don't know if there's a different example here. Is it this might be it then? I think this example. I think so. Three three processors, three models, so you got nine. But if you were to do crosses true false, you get just three matching. Yes, that's one, one, two, that's two, three, three. Yeah. Uh, that's so, the that is so definitely I think true. This is what you were talking about when you feed it more than one model. And I think this might be. Yeah, so yeah, crosses them. So then I guess this is how you would set it up if it was more than two models in multiple yeah, I think so. in different recipes. So yeah, I think this, this here itself might be a better example to include in the book, in my opinion. I think it does show that clarification because I don't, I don't know how many times people would just do a work set just for one model. I think if you have the intention of using a work set, you have the intention of using more than one model and maybe multiple different recipes. Mm -hmm. So I think this example here kind of answers your question. And I think. All right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. Like if I'm using a workflow set, I'm usually trying out many different things. Yeah. So my cross is usually always true. Um, on that, actually, um, I don't know if the next chapters cover them, but do you guys know if I can specify tune grids? I guess that's next chapter. But you know, when you're trying to like a logistic, uh, sorry, a penalized regression versus like a random force, like it fails if you don't give it like a specific grid. So I, I, don't, I don't know if anyone knows that. I think the work set does. That is part of the arguments that I think it gets. I can feed it like a integer and then it'll try like a bunch of random stuff. But I've these, tried, yeah. These are the current functions it allows or that you can feed it. I think you have to do it separate. Like do tuning on the model and then do model selection. I don't think you can both tune one model in a set with a grid and also. So like have one, one tune grid for this one and refit sample for the other one? Is that where you? Or I, I guess you would have to like, tune 
the model before and then add it to your set. Yeah. Is, is that what you usually do, Joanne? Um, I usually get stuck there and just kind of take it out of the workflow set usually, but I can yeah. feed it like a number and then it'll try that number of combinations. So if, I, if I'm tuning, you know, uh, like a penalty in a penalized model and I don't know, and try in like a random forest model, I, I can't really explicitly define them. But if I gave it a random number as a grid argument, it'll try a bunch of different combinations and it won't fail. I know the R folks who compete in uh, Slice Sliced. Use, use this stuff all the time. Like I know Josiah did something with grids and workflow sets. So I wonder if it's just worth like looking at, I, I don't know if he posted his um, Slice code or what, but or look at or rewatch that particular episode. Yeah, I think his first one's on YouTube. Because um, I definitely know he was doing something weird with tuning a grid for like XG Boost and a bunch of other um, models and stuff like that. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'll try tomorrow. <laughs> I, I, I also know that like the workflow itself will take a tuning grid. And I don't know what the relationship between a single workflow and a workflow set, but I guess you could, in theory, put a workflow in a workflow set. I think that's you how can. you would get your tuning grid. I think you can save, like, I think you can, I think in one of these, you can, like, for example, if you have, I don't know what, I think they might have included it in the book here. You can add a work set, like right here, I think. So these four, oh, well, my bad. Um, so you have these three basic ones and then you can add a work set from the random forest. And I think, and then when you, and this itself is a work set, I think. And so within that work set, you can specify that tune grid and then add it separately and then continue on. I think that might, I think that is a work set within a work set, within a work set, a workflow. You know, am I using the right words? Um, a workflow within a work set. There we go. So I think you can do that. You can, if you define it in like you want to bring, oh, I want to add this this random force later on because I need it, or I want to include it because I'm curious about it. You don't have to then, if you've done it earlier, then you can, as long as you have say workflow to true, you can just call it in and just add, add, add it in there to your four models. So you go from your three models that was up here from these three to a fourth one here that is just added in that should have whatever you define within that workflow. Okay, so that's a fitted workflow, I think, RFRES. Yeah, so I think a fitted workflow with, let me see. In this case, is it required that you use the same resampling? I guess it makes sense in that way that, that you can combine different workflows that you fit it with. Yes, I think you can do that. So I think that that's one way and it is, yeah, it's a random force. And I think the workflow, I think it's the output is the workflow itself. I'll probably have to, I'd look into that more. I think, I don't I can't remember what this variable itself is, but it might be that workflow and that workflow fitted after at the very end of everything. At the very end, after you go through your workflow, you fit the model and everything. I think the initial step is the workflow that does contain if you do decide to tune it. Okay. Oh, another question actually. Um, you know how if you don't feed the function, it decides if it wants to 
fit resample or tune grid. Do you guys know how that's implemented? Like if you have a workflow set of like a linear model in a random forest, it'll resample on the linear model and it'll tune grid on the random forest because random forest is the only one that has other parameters. I don't, to be honest, I don't know if you can, I, and I think that's what I was wondering if it's use this function for this model, use this function for that model. I don't know if that's possible. So on the help page, it looks like tune grid is the default argument okay. value. And then it says in the details, any case where a model has no tuning parameter, but tune grid is called, fit resamples will be used instead. And a warning is issued if verbose equals true. OK. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> Oh yeah, like you see there, um, could you go up um, to the spec? A little more up, a little more up. Yeah, there you go. Okay, K and spec, card spec, you see how that's tuning a bunch of stuff? Like how are those grid defined? Like I don't, I don't see any grid being explicitly being fed into anything. Like what are they tuning on? What grid are they tuning on? I've never encountered, I've never used tunes before, so I wouldn't. I personally wouldn't put it now. I think whatever the default is, I think, I assume. But I, I don't know if that answers your question here then. So if you want to tune, keep this one to tune and use this a different tune here, a, a different version or explicitly define it, I think then you can, that might answer that question of using, no, I don't think so. No, it's, it won't because the workflow map down here refers to the tune grid. So maybe not. Sorry, I just posted the default values of tune grid. See that grid equals 10? Yeah. Like I think that tries 10 different combinations of whatever hyperparameters you're trying to tune in, I think randomly. I think that's how it works. But you can also feed in a tibble explicitly as that grid. So I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering how workflow sets does this. Do you know what package that tune function this is, is from? Off tune the, package. Uh, tune, fun, uh, tune package. There's also oh. a workflow sets tune grid. Don't know what the difference is. Oh, just an export. Yeah, it's a uh, tune package. A data frame of tuning combinations or a positive integer. An integer denotes the number of candidate parameter sets to be created automatically. So that automatically is pretty confusing to me. My initial guess is um, 10 evenly spaced numbers and it tries to figure out what, what it could be. <laughs> but yeah, I guess that that is kind of confusing because some parameters are like zero to one or like mm -hmm. zero to infinity. Um, so yeah, I do not know what that means. 
automatically. Yeah. Um, but I want to say that there's prop because because the number of functions that Titan model accepts is limited. I want to say they probably have a way to compute those <laughs> automatically. But yeah, that's definitely a ask the rest of the Slack channel question. <laughs> if it's if it hasn't been like talked about already. Yeah. Yeah, like I like drilling into hyperparameters sometimes. And then when I do run into that step, I usually take that out of the workflow set and just work on one workflow. But yeah. 